ಹಾರ Okay, so it's the 100th episode. It's the 100th episode of A Modeler's Life. A life of a modeler. And tonight, right now, right now, right at the beginning of the show, I can't decide really if this should be the end of the show or the beginning, but I think I'm going to start because if it wasn't for this fella, I wouldn't be in your ear right now. Or I wouldn't be on your on your Bose speaker, or I wouldn't be on your car radio. I, if, if Peter Borchardt, if you're in southern England tooling around going to another job, I wouldn't be on your radio, or Stuart Sterling driving to Orange Fa- Air Fairbanks, Alaska, I wouldn't be on the radio. So it's because of this guy right here, Chris Atkins. Thank you very much, Chris Atkins. <laughs> oh, hey, no problem, no problem. Glad to be an inspiration. <laughs> no, that's not true. It's because of Tom Barbalay. Tom, where do you live exactly? San Jose, California, I just remembered. I do, I do. Let's not forget Jim Gifford. He's picking up a Mac Cafe currently listening to us. Oh, wow. Oh, really? really? Like you're putting, yep. this, you're putting this out ahead of time? How it curves South Australia, listening in. Uh, isn't that like uh, some sort of copyright infringement laws that I'm going to have to get my lawyer <laughs> to call you about? <laughs> not me, Lionel. <laughs> when, when, when you say Mac Cafe, do you mean a... Coffee from McDonald's. So this What's is an up? interesting. This is an interesting point. Adelaide, South Australia. The coffee was so good there. The indigenous coffee. Starbucks couldn't set up. There are no Starbucks in Adelaide, South Australia. There's Starbucks all the rest of Australia, but not Adelaide because the coffee was so good. But McDonald's, because they had existing like restaurants, realized that they could try to chip in. So they do have Mac Cafe and. The only time I've ever had this is with Jim Gifford in drive through listening to your very podcast. So I know exactly where Jim Gifford is currently. I know what he's doing. I have that sensory information. Ah, okay. So then there's no need for me to get my my bank of lawyers. Like, I don't no need point. for me, to make, me, my people to get in touch with your people. No, no my people <laughs> left a long time ago. <laughs> right. Okay. So it's just t- me and my shotgun. All right. <laughs> so, okay. So we got, so Tom. So when I told people I was going to interview, then a bunch of guys said, oh, yeah, I want to I want to be part of that. So tonight we have Chris Atkins, who is from Argyle, Texas, home of the Argyle Fighting Sox. Hello. Hello. Have you guys ever talked? Have you guys ever even met? <laughs> I think yeah, Chris Atkins. I've been, on yeah. the, I've been on the podcast. Oh, okay. You have. All right. My podcast, I think. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. The, the spinoff. And then yeah. we have uh, Bruce Medford, who is super fan number one. <laughs> And the creator of the Kelly Questions. Do you like how he emerged where you live and your name together? I know. Was awesome. I know. I know. I know. Well, Hi, Tom. Hey, Bruce. How's how it going? You? I'm doing Always very well. Always a pleasure talking to you. Always yes, a pleasure it is. talking to you. And then finally, we have everybody's grumpy neighbor, Ralph Renzetti. Get on my, my grumpy neighbors. <laughs> uh, Ralph, is, Ralph is the <laughs> nicest man I could possibly want in my neighborhood. Believe me. Huh? Ralph. Feel free to move to San Jose. We'll have you anytime. Okay. I'll bring the boys I'll bring the boys with me. Just Very in case good. you need some help. Very good. So keep people off your front porch. Exactly. So Tom, tell us everything you've learned since you were on the very first episode, which was like three years ago. I've learned that this community is vast. You could find people that I never knew about in this hobby, Lionel. So hats off to you. Happy one hundred. Okay, but uh, yeah, like I mean, is that's what blew, that's what blows me away about the podcast is like the community that you can build. Unbelievable! Just by talking, Who yeah, would have yeah, just by talking, and uh, and it's like so cool. So I mean, you, you're what have you learned in three in the last three and a half years on your podcast? Like, what is? Oh my goodness! What do you think about the hobby? What do you, what is since you started the podcast? So the reason you're on is because. Mm-hmm. I was on your podcast. I'll relay mm-hmm. this story to everybody. I was actually just relaying it to Joe Cummings. So Bruce Wilson uh, insisted I had to be on your podcast. Of Bruce, course. Bruce the mailboy. And I yeah. said, I don't want to be on his podcast. He said, no, 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 come on, podcast. And I said, I don't want to go on the podcast because I haven't really been active in the hobby for a few years, a couple of years. 
And people are going to be asking me questions because I was in Model Railroader and I won't have any answers. So finally he talked me into it. And I went on your podcast and people wanted me to answer questions because I'd been in Model Railroader. But then, but then, here's the, here's the kicker. Then mm-hmm. I listened to it and I loved the sound of my own voice. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> so I, but so I, I caught... put a lot of effort into making your voice sound particularly good, Lionel. I mean, you can't negate the post-production effort Exa- as well, right? Exactly. So then I, so then I, I would call in a few more times and uh, commandeer my section of the show. Certainly. And uh, I probably one night left in a huff, thinking I was only on for like an hour, and you only gave me like an hour, and I thought. I'm going to just start my own podcast because I love the sound of my own voice. Damn skippy. And, and I really thought that only a few people would listen. That's what, that's what threw me off was that like way more than a few people have listened. Hmm. And, uh, so it's because of you that we now have this podcast and this is the 100th episode. I have many, many variations of the show on the old AML network, but the, the main, the, the original, purpose of the show was twice a month i would i would interview somebody and have them on and the first monday of or well now it is the first monday i I always meant the first of the month and the middle of the month and now it's the first monday of the month and the third monday of the month and it's the 100th episode and and so i felt like i feel like you're my bill murray bill murray Mm. bill murray and david letterman Mm. Bill Murray was on the very first David Letterman, and then when David Letterman changed networks, uh, he was uh, Bill Murray was on the very first show again, and then at the end, Bill Murray was on. The, I feel like you are my Bill Murray. Mm. I feel you are my David Letterman. Without question. <laughs> <laughs> so what's new? So uh, tell us. I haven't talked to you for a while. What's new in the world of Let's- Tom Bar? Let's talk about David Letterman for a minute here. So I went to New Zealand recently. Right. And I went to New Zealand for the sole purpose of meeting my great uncle. Now, my father's father fought in the Second World War. I think, did your father's father, did your father or your father, you, you have military connections as well, don't you? Yes, my whole, all my father and four uncles fought in World War Two. Yes. So I went out to uh, see my great uncle and his collective children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren and my great uncle used to cut David Letterman's hair. Really? So oh, he sorry. was a barber by training, and he originally started by cutting men's hair, and then he ended up in L.A., as you do, cutting David Letterman's hair. But then he realized that the real money was in women's barber shops, or whatever they call hairdressing salons. So he opened hairdressing salons, and he lived his life in luxury from cutting hair. This is your, and your, your great uncle? Yes, this is my father's uncle. And do you have some uncles that aren't so great? Yeah, I've got lesser <laughs> uncles. Believe me, I met plenty of them on my trip to Australia as well. I've met plenty of lesser uncles. And but yeah, it's a... His name is Barbalay also. Yes, he, it is. It is. Hmm. His name is Bernard Barbalay. Huh. So you can find his wife, Betty Barbalay, on Facebook and his children, uh, Lorraine and Graham Barbalay. I think Graham Barbalay is a listener to some of my podcasts. I'm not sure if he's a listener to... The AML network, but I can certainly point him in that direction. Yeah, well, we yeah. don't want to bore him to death. Um, yeah. uh, Betty and Betty and Bernie Barbalay. Yes. Can you say that three times really fast? <laughs> I've got allergies, unfortunately, currently, Lionel. It's miraculous I'm talking to you at all, but let's just continue. <laughs> okay. So you have other pods. So, uh, but I want to know what's happened on the Model Rail. So, how often do you do Model Rail Radio? Uh, I'm trying to do it about once a month currently. I get it kind of once every three weeks, typically. But something happened to me at the end of last year. I went on a long road trip. I crossed the US and then came back for another podcast that I was recording. And the gentleman, having met me, this bodes well for you and me, Lionel, so keep this in mind. Having met me, decided that he never wanted to record podcasts with me again. So (laughs) I went through some kind of deconstruction associated with what I was doing with these podcasting things. And I realized that the one true love, in terms of listener love, that I get back is through Model Rail Radio. Everyone who I interact with through Model Rail Radio, Andy Dixon and Wales, the folks down in Kent, we've already talked about Jim Gifford in South Australia, even, if I can mention his name, the professor in Sydney. These folk, when I come into their company, treat me better than my family treats me. So I've realized very quickly 
the, this thing, Model Rail Radio, and what you're doing with AML, these, these hobby podcasts, these Model Rail Radio podcasts, people love. Like, it's beyond religion. It's very, very strange. So I think the next step, I'm reading Hubbard currently, I'm tracking various other cults. I think the next step is to make this into a fully-fledged religion and to get charity <laughs> status in the US. <laughs> That's actually not a bad idea. That's actually pretty easy, yeah. I think you're on it. Oh, is it? Yeah. Is it easy to do? Oh, yeah. yeah. It's okay. Easy. Actually, who's, so, who's talking to me? Tony Cook, uh, editor of Model Railroad News. He made a very valid point, and I don't think, I don't, this is going to come out the way I would say it. It's going to sound like I'm insulting everybody in model railroading, but it's not intended that way. <laughs> he said he thinks all model railroaders have some form of some, some, somewhere on the scale of ADD. Hmm. Fair enough. Because we're all so r- r- wrapped up in it. We all like it so much that all of us are so, you know, so, um, focused on it. Mm hmm. And I think he's right. I think it, I think you have to have some some version of that in order to to enjoy the hobby, because the well, hobby it's a fairly it's a fairly large endeavor to build a layout. Certainly, and you're looking for perfection, right? On some level, I mean, we've got a Ralph Ranzetti as close to modeling perfection as you can get in podcast form. But my perspective is that's exactly right, and I think. My background before Model Rail Radio was interviewing academics and research folk, but doing it in such a light that I made them feel welcome and human and able to talk about their particular intellectual proclivities. And that's basically what I do with Model Rail Radio. I make a warm, nurturing environment where I do plenty of copious post-production to make everyone sound as good as they can possibly sound. And, yeah, it creates a nurturing environment where people feel safe to talk about this crazy thing which you know in general good company people might be a bit embarrassed to talk about but certainly on our podcasts the hobby comes out yeah it's a it's a i can i'm convinced after doing the podcast it's like being an mi it's being a member of mi6 mm, you don't definitely you don't talk about it but it turns out every other guy's part of mi6 so everybody else is a, a, an undercover agent of some sort exactly um, Se- secret handshakes, these kind of things. Well, yeah, like every it's a, but it's a kind of hop. There's something about trains. Like I'm, I've been asking people lately, like, what is it about this hobby? Like, what is it about this hobby that that makes people drawn to it? You know, it's 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 massive. It's way bigger. Mm. That was a question I wanted to ask you. Now, Ralph or or Bruce or Chris, if any of you guys have questions, feel free to jump in. Okay. Okay. All right. Are you having fun so far, Ralph? Absolutely. Tom said you're like uh, a modeler extraordinaire, which I agree. He's also an excellent artist, too. Mm. And Bruce is uh, president of every model railroad club within uh, 100 miles of Medford, Oregon. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and Chris doesn't know he's Texan. Not at all. Very good. <laughs> uh, but uh, that's cool. Like uh, um, Chris is building a layout in a... In a how is it? 16 by 80 foot section, Texas and Pacific section house. Like everybody's, everybody's that is involved in the podcast is excited about the hobby. So I wanted to ask you what, so you do it about once a month. Mm-hmm. Do you feel like the hobby is becoming, do you feel like more people in the, like how long have you been doing model rail radio? Uh, since 2009, I think. So almost you're coming up to 10 years. Almost coming up to 10 years, yes. And do you remember when exactly it was you started? Do you have some sort of a record of I that? Think it was, I think it was September, early in September 2009, if I recall correctly. And I started with just a couple of monologues. That's right, I, I remember. I Chris Abbott call in. Yes, I remember. And then it snowballed from there. I mean, Chris Abbott, I, I don't know how long I would have done the monologues for, but having Chris Abbott on was just amazing. Yeah. And then other people started calling in. And yeah, it just, I can remember, I remember on one of my trips to Florida, I was, I decided I was going to start listening to model rail (laughs) rodeo, model rail radio. Did you come up with that name on purpose? So it would be hard to say model, model rail radio. I started, I started right from the beginning on one of my trips to Florida and I remember your monologues (laughs) and I remember slamming my head into the steering wheel thinking, will this guy ever stop talking? Sam Skippy. (laughs) (laughs) That's not what I thought at all. So, 
Yeah, I remember you started with the monologues, and then Chris Abbott joined in. Mm -hmm. And th at the same time, did you state, start the Facebook page? Yeah, I think it all... I mean, I had a background in doing this kind of thing already with regards to other kinds of groups. So I had a set formula associated with how to put a web page together and a Facebook page, and there's a lamented Twitter account. And I mean, all these various components, I already knew kind of what to do. So I put all these things together, and I mean, the Facebook page is a thing in and of itself. I mean, there are people on the Facebook page that post frequently that have never heard the podcast. They just like the community on Facebook. So, Oh, that's kind of cool. Yeah. So uh, do you, how many, yeah, you have like over 2,000 followers. You have 2,830 members. Yep. Of which I am to, I am proud to say I am one. And, proud of that too, Lionel. And uh, do you have any, any idea of how many people listen to your podcast? Uh, if we can start, if, I'm, I'm not going to answer your question, then I'm going to answer your question. I wanted to just say, we spent, one of the funny stories that I have associated with the okay. Facebook page. Just Let before me, just before you go yeah. on, that's one of the rules yeah. I have developed over the last three and a half years. Oh, I have I, to I, answer your question? No, I, no. I'll determine whether or not it's funny. Okay, very good. Let me tell you the story. <laughs> well, my father, this is, this is, when my father sees me, which is about once every two years, he exclaims that this is the best thing that I've ever done. So let me explain this to you. We had a problem about five years ago where we'd have Swedish bikini models join Model Rail Radio. And they accounted for about 500-odd members of the Facebook page when we were up to 3,000 and change then. So I created a separate group called Bikini Model Railroaders which is a Facebook group where I post the photos of the people trying to join Facebook where the model rail radio page were clearly bikini models. And then I actually realized that there's this subgenre of model railroading associated with women in bikinis on trains, around rail tracks, these kind of things. So we had people come and join this group as well. And yeah, it's one of these offshoot communities that's come out of model rail radio that my father will thoroughly endorse. In fact, many men apparently will endorse this particular community. So that's the sideline to your story. Is that funny? <laughs> yes. We got chuckles. <laughs> yeah. So what Very was good. the problem with the bikini, the women, uh, bikini clad women joining? What was the problem with that? I didn't follow you. They weren't, they weren't model railroaders, unfortunately. I think they were looking for something else. Maybe uh, men that have a little bit more time and money on their hands than most, and maybe, I don't know. I don't know if it was a romantic interest. I don't know if it was budget shoes or what they were trying to sell, but they weren't model railroaders, and it became clear that there was this growing community of folk that had nothing to do with the underlying Facebook page. Yeah, that's the biggest problem I find with the podcast. There's a lot of people on here that are far more intelligent than me, and I'm still not following you. What's the problem with the bikini-clad women joining the page? <laughs> 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 they're not really women they're men in nigeria oh, That's the oh they're men yeah. in nigeria oh okay well they're good looking men let me tell you <laughs> <laughs> anyway <laughs> to answer your question associated with how many people listen to the podcast which was your original question before i digressed uh, i don't have a clue anymore and i don't really care i mean as far as i'm concerned model rail radio is my ability to go anywhere in the world and have lunch and dinner with interesting people to escape from my family when I need to escape from my family and to just have a community of folk that are, for example, let's take Andy Dixon because he's a good example of this. I didn't know Andy Dixon from anyone. I was having dinner. He was making me a curry in his house with his family around him, enjoying Wrexham in Wales. I wouldn't have been able to do that just as a regular schlub. I mean, I think the thing that I find with the podcast, firstly, numbers are really ethereal. There are every different podcasting site has a different way of collating numbers. Apple has thrown their hat in the ring. I just, you know, it's not something that I track anymore. What I track is how many people call into a show, whether there's a general community support for the shows, and literally when I can travel, you know, how many people I meet in the various places that I go to. I mean, you've met you know, probably nearly as many as Jim Gifford associated with folks in this hobby through this podcast, right? Lionel, you know how many people you've met through this thing. Oh, That's I, what's important. Absolutely, beyond a shadow of a doubt of the one thing that absolutely... I, I'm, I'm, I'm gobsmacked, I'm speechless about is the, is the community that, I've, uh, that we've been able to create. 
and the number of people I've met. And that's why I think the hobby is way bigger than anybody realizes. Without question. It's like way bigger than anybody realizes. Yeah. Like there's no way I'll ever, like I can remember when I started Jason Rice. I always say Reese. Rice. Yeah. He Reese. says Rice. Yeah. And I, I still don't think he knows how to pronounce his name. But I'm pretty sure it's Jason. Um, mm -hmm. Anyways, uh, I, I, he was like the third or fourth person we interviewed. And uh, I remember telling him, he says, well, what are your plans? And I said, oh, I'm going to try to, you know, um, two a month, which would be roughly, roughly 25 people a year. And he says, oh, that's that's pretty ambitious, which kind of scared me at the time. And mm. at the at the at in the beginning, it was kind of hard. Like some people that were easy to get a hold of, like Joe D'Amato and stuff like that. I talked to him for a couple of a couple of uh, shows. But now it's like I have no idea how I could ever in a million years, talk to everybody that needs to be talked to in model railroading. Mm. Like, well, you sucked me in big time. Did I suck you in? Yeah. Well, that's good. A absolutely. I, I see it as a big plus. Oh, yeah. It's a huge plus. It's a, it's a huge, the community. That's why, that's a, now I will get on to your favorite subject, Tom, the NMRA. Mm, I was wondering how long it would take before it had come up. Well, I, I'm happy to talk to you about it because I'm convinced beyond a shadow of a doubt also that if the NMRA could uh, in, uh, embrace the digital world, it would make the it would also make the NMRA grow. Well, that's something that you've done a lot better than I have. I mean, when I was reflecting on your 100th episode, you have been able to tackle the NMRA in a way that I, I don't know, I'm not really a political person. I'm not really interested in these kind of things. And when I've met Charlie gets a couple of times and I've said, come on the podcast. And he never comes on the podcast. So it's just like, okay, well, that's something that they lose. The directors of the NMRA, I interviewed them about eight, nine years ago. These are a group of men, not all of them, but some of them that will walk away from me in train shows, not making eye contact. So my perspective with regards to the NMRA is, eh, you know, it's a functioning thing in some regard for a small group of people. You took this thing, which just irritates me and not something that I particularly want to do podcast recordings on and you went into the belly of the beast right <laughs> guns blazing big time big time guns blazing and you you did amazing things i mean you made you made the nmra accountable in ways that the nmra i mean just the stuff associated with uh, you know a variety of factors i don't even need to name names here but as far as i'm concerned you've done amazing work with the nmra and it comes from your background passion i mean you <laughs> you've had dealings with the nmra for more than 20 years now so for you, you've got the legacy and the history associated with this organization, whereas I just look at it and go, eh, what's he doing? <laughs> okay. So, all right. That was a, that was a good subject. <laughs> I don't think I've done anything other than ask a few questions. Well, you got them to answer some questions, which well, yeah, that was kind of cool. I've been able to do. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the only problem is they, the only problem is they answered the questions with their own answers. So they're still kind of stuck in that. I don't, I think some of them aren't sure that the, the internet is anything but a fad. Mm -hmm. Um, because they're a bunch of old farts <laughs> says our resident old fart. Yeah. Well, hey, it takes one, takes one. To <laughs> well, know. no, but you know, you're on YouTube modelers. Uh, and you've embraced, yeah. uh, Ralph, you've embraced the internet. You've got your, you, you know, like I bugged you for quite a while there about getting your Facebook page and you really enjoy yeah. that now. Yeah. And, and you really enjoy the, the ability to connect with people through, and I mean, you're a, you're a, you're a very good, you know, I mean, you're an excellent modeler. I mean, people need to know that Ralph is an excellent artist. He's a, he's a, and I mean, I'll never forget the time we did that that uh train masters tv thing about weathering and i thought oh he's brought some uh, some some uh, locomotive shells where he made a mistake and you turned them into these blobs of goo into these actual weathered things which i'll never know how you did that but you've you've embraced the internet you're on the youtube model builders and all that stuff yep so it's a so i but I, tom i'm really interested i mean you've been doing mm -hmm. this for almost 10 years Mm -hmm. You must have some nugget of, of like, do you feel like the hobby's growing? Do you feel like, do, oh, you, I, do you feel like, I, here's a, here's a question. Do you feel like more people are becoming attuned to podcasting from now, 10 years later than when you started? It's difficult to say. I mean, podcasting is a form. Let's just talk about the hobby first. Cause I think that was your original question. The, the nature of the hobby is clearly expanding. It's clearly reaching out to more people. It's clearly 
just through, well, who knows what will happen with YouTube, but let's hope YouTube, let's hope, I mean, it's always, anyway, let's say that YouTube continues in a positive direction, then all these different ways that people can get access to the hobby, as you probably well know, this was one statistic I used to track, I've stopped tracking it, but around the festive period, you know, when people erect a tree and this kind of stuff, I would always get a bump in listeners around that period of time, because people get a new device be it an android or an ios device or a new laptop and they're like well what can we play here oh, the podcast so it's christmas time oh let's think about you know trains model railroading and you know every year a new group of listeners comes just through that ritual alone so my perspective is that when you talk about fear and this is both with regards to the traditional magazine that you've mentioned repeatedly but also with regards to the nmra they const they have this view that there's a fight that it's a finite resource that it's very precious and they've got to control it and they've got to maintain it because it's disappearing and people are dying and it's a hobby that's <laughs> dying and all this kind of nonsense which is completely removed from the experience of anyone that has done things like you and I have done with podcasts. It's not a finite resource at all. It's an almost infinite resource. It's about inspiring people to create things with their hands and their minds associated with railroading. I mean, it, you can't get any more basic than that and the fact that there is fear in these old media organizations and the nmra and the, oh, the, the hobby's dying or are we losing no it's changing but it's also growing at the same time well yeah there's so many manufacturers coming into it i mean i was talking at springfield uh i talked to, i went around and i had this uh zoom h5 digital recorder and two, mm. two handheld mics and i was walking around interviewing people it's really great now i have a reason to, i walk up to people and they go hey can i talk to you and it's mm. like they can't go away because they feel embarrassed if they walk away, you know. So mm. and, then, and then I try to get a free hot dog out of them, and it's like it's great. Um, Ron Kleiss, it, a name that you know well, right? Now becoming a kit manufacturer. Yes. Yep. So just by talking, we can inspire people not just to create amazing things in the hobby, but actually to start businesses in the hobby. Yes, that's why I was going to say there's so many manufacturers starting up. Like, yeah. like so many freight, that, that just, uh, so many freight car manufacturers are start. there's so many of those guys and locomotive manufacturers and like scaletrains.com and Maloco and Tangent. Mm. I mean, these aren't startups, but these are companies <laughs> that produce high end, you know, like Maloco's cars are all, and Tangent are all around the $50 mark. And these are high end cars. And I mean, I, I interviewed both of those guys and, you know, they were kind of beating people away with a stick. Well. While the show is going on. Mm. So, I mean, I just don't see, of course, the hobby's been dying. For, I'm 64, and I guess for <clears> 59 <throat> of my years, it's been dying. <laughs> yes. Oh, well. Um, but I still want to, I still want some nugget of, I, I'm not going to talk to you for the whole hour because I want to talk to other people for the 100th episode. Certainly. No, most definitely. I'm boring anyway. No, so you're get, not boring. Get done with you, me. you know what? I'm, let's, oh, that's, let's, that's not true. You're not boring. No, you're not boring. Oh. You don't so press. You want a nugget? You, you want a nugget? Here's a nugget. I was sitting with Bruce Kelly at uh, Portland, the NMRA show in Portland. Bruce and I spent about an hour and a half talking. I think. Yeah, we talked we about talk marijuana. We talked yep. about marijuana. <laughs> <laughs> Everything. It was not a topic untouched. Yes. Except true. for the topic of model railroading, because we were surrounded by it, and we could just be two guys chatting. And. No, look, my perspective is actually that model railroading touches so many different people, and the people it touches are unbelievably fascinating. And they're fascinating in the eccentric proclivities that you've talked about, about obsession and these kind of things. But they also tend to be genuinely interesting people in other aspects of their life as well. Yeah, that's true. So absolutely. That's, true. That's, what makes, well, you, that's what makes my podcast work, is like I wanted to talk to exactly. people about... Other stuff other than just model railroading. Certainly. Which is, so, uh, when are you going to, and I was just looking at your page here, your model rail radio uh, uh, internet page, or uh, you're on the World Wide Web, the WWW. Mm -hmm. and, and I see here the first paragraph says, model rail radio consistently provides the best model railroading content. Oh, I was, I was sticking it to a, a particular magazine when I wrote that. Uh -huh. I was making the point very, very clear that um, 
My apologies, Lionel. I didn't mean to offend you with that. I think that's been there for about nine years, hasn't it? It has. Yeah, no, I was making it very clear early on. Um, so what particular magazine were you were you trying to... to, to get, what is it, Model, model Railroader? It's kind of subtle. In, in fact, what's particularly fascinating is every time I go to a national, I like going to the Model Railroader booth, and they always pitch me that I need to get large format ads within their publication because of course, ah, that's what that's I do. That's not a bad idea. And, and what I find interesting, I'm, I'm thinking, I'm, I do have a couple of ads that I've thought about putting up, but they're not in the best taste, so we'll just move those aside. But seriously, this is a magazine that is the dying part of the hobby. I mean, this is a magazine that has failed to embrace technology, has kind of run to embrace technology now, had a proprietary format for the longest period of time associated with their, you know, ways you could get their magazine electronically. It, they, I mean, you've, you've been crowned here, Lionel. You've, through a series of quite amazing factors, you've been a part of this hallowed publication. <laughs> but I would go to open, you know, open houses. I think Grand Rapids was the first example of this. Where the model railroader guys turned up, it was at Bruce Chubb's layout. I'm sure you're familiar with Bruce Chubb's layout. Like, yes, I'm familiar with it. I've only been there, I think I've only been there twice. Yeah. So f for the benefit of the listeners, Bruce Chubb's layout is a five layer, in some cases, layout. It goes through the bathroom, as all good layouts should. It basically is one of the most extreme layouts you could ever possibly imagine. Literally track on top of track on top of track looped around i don't know i mean it looks like a standard house basement but it just has so much stuff going on every possible direction so my early experience going to the national and going to bruce chubb's layout was that the model railroader folk turned up probably five minutes after i arrived and proceeded to push me in closer and closer towards the bathroom to the point where <laughs> i was just literally leaning up against the bathroom door like when the, are these guys going to move and the egos were uh, palpable let's just say just going around, you know, shaking people's hands, you know, I'm, we're blessing this layout here. We're um, here. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. A year later, three of these guys didn't have jobs anymore. Oh. And a year later, <laughs> the, you know, the magazine didn't do as well as they were hoping. But also, I then went to Portland and one of the guys that lost their jobs had gotten another job doing another thing. And I came up to him and I shook his hand and he just looked at me like I'd killed him, like I'd killed his <laughs> job. I was responsible for the death of this magazine. And my view is, and obviously you're familiar with m many of the folk that we're talking with, familiar with the hobbyist magazine and the way the hobbyist magazine has worked, you know, in this circumstance. I mean, Joe Fugate, Joe and I always shake hands, always trade information when I see Joe. But he's, he always sets up right next to Model Railroader as well. To be right in their face all the time. Look, my view is people such as yourself, Dave Frary, a wide variety of folk. I was just chatting with Marty McGurk. I've got all the time in the world for people like Marty. Clearly, a number of amazing folk in the hobby have come through this magazine. But it takes itself way too seriously. And unfortunately, it's kind of missed a few steps. So... I still, I still have a subscription. I still thumb through it when I see people I know whose layouts are in there. I always send them emails and say congratulations. Sometimes it takes like three to five years before layouts actually get published in the magazine these days. It does. So, yeah. So my perspective is it's part of the ecosystem early on. Eh, I would never say there was any ego part of it. But I just wanted to make the point that actually by opening, creating an open community where anyone could call in. Right you would actually gather far more interesting and diverse hobbyists from all over the world than you would through this selective, eulogized publication with its ads and all this other kind of stuff. So it was a contrast, basically, between what I was trying to do with Model Rail Radio and what they had been doing for how yeah, many years. I think so. I think that's the thing. Like, what you did was a, a pioneering thing. I mean, I owe a great deal of, uh, I owe a great, I don't know what the word is, debt or gratitude or something to Kambach and Model Railroader because they allowed me to be part of it for many, 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 many years. And I learned an awful lot about publishing and journalism and how to write and there's and photography. There's many, many things that I owe. Uh, I certainly owe uh, 
a debt to Model Railroad for them allowing me to be part of their family, um, for sure. But what you've done is totally a separate from what they've done. And you've, you've created, like you said, I, like I said, this, this podcast would not exist had you not let me come on there and pontificate and uh, carry on. So I think, it, I think it's important that everybody realizes it was Tom Barbelay. Tom Barbelay is the Bill Murray of Modeler's Life. A Modeler's Life. Do you like A Modeler's Life or Modeler's Life? When I started it, I think A Modeler's Life seems to stick, but I thought it would be shortened down to Modeler's Life, but that never really stuck. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. This is The Modeler's Life, so. Interesting. Yeah, no, it's A Modeler's uh, Life, yeah. I, I, wanted to, I wanted to just make one point here, because I started Model Rail Radio from a background of podcasting. I've been doing podcasting since 2006, basically. But there were two model rail podcasts that came out before mine. Okay. And that was the Scotty Mason show. Scotty right. is still around. He still records a monthly. And also Ryan Anderson's model yes. rail cast. Yes. Yep. And it's important to note, to note these two gentlemen because I think they certainly, I mean, Ryan and I, in fact, Scotty and I as well, were in communication from their first episodes. I think I'm on episode two of the Scotty Mason show and I'm on probably either the third or the fourth of, of Brian Anderson's podcast, just writing in saying, you know, great job you're doing these things, blah, blah, blah. And Scotty Mason was particularly funny because they made a joke in the first episode that uh, no one would listen to this podcast who was modeling Southern Nevada, and I was modeling Southern Nevada at the time, so I let them know, you know, very funny, I'm modeling Southern Nevada. But no, look, these gentlemen created uh, a format, and most hobbies, if you look at any hobbies, I know you like, you know, motorbikes and a variety of other things most hobbies have at least 15 to 20 podcasts in their genre when i started model rail radio it was very much the fact that there are only other two other podcasts so it's like and they're missing certain things that you know i could see model rail radio filling but that isn't taking away from either of them because i think you know scotty mason just had such a breadth of knowledge to start off with yeah and he knew everyone and he was able to bring on a wide variety of folk early on plus he had the camaraderie and look I don't know how you feel about Dave Freire, but I think Dave Freire is just an amazing human being. And so, you know, these kind of folk. And then Ryan had his own perspective. I mean, you've taken aspects of what Ryan did with Model Wildcast with your podcast. I mean, associated with Libsyn and stuff, a lot of the infrastructure stuff you do similar to Ryan. So, yeah, I think these two created a community. And I've had both. I've had I. I think I've only had Ryan on once before he passed away. I'm trying to think. Maybe I've had him on twice. Um, and Scotty, the doors are always open. We don't talk about baseball too much on Model Rail Radio, but we do like having Scotty on. So, yeah, these two gentlemen, I think, created podcasts which were in a space that, you know, Model Rail Radio could comfortably exist in. Um, and, yeah, I don't want to sound like I'm the first Model Rail podcast because I certainly wasn't. And there were a bunch of other podcasts. I mean, in your part of the world, uh, there was the model railway show, I think it was, it was the model railway show. Um, yeah. And why do they and, go, you know, why, why do they, some of these shows go away? Like I know with Ryan, unfortunately he passed away, but I mean, I, I know a lot of the other shows, uh, some of them shows go away and I wonder if it's just, I mean, how much work is it to do a podcast? Like I can't figure it out because, uh, I feel like it's not very much work, but I don't really seem to be able to get beyond two or three a week. I think. If you want to edit podcasts with a certain degree, I mean, I spend a lot of time in the editing. So for every hour that I record, I spend about two hours editing. Um, wow. My perspective is that it takes a very particular kind of person, as you well know, being one of those particular kind of people, to record podcasts. You need to put some of the obsession and interest into, you know, what we talked about with Model Railroad is into audio and getting ideas out in a particular form. And I think that is... I talked to Tom Comboy recently. I'm not sure if you know Tom, but Tom. he had a podcast that was on and off, and he's recorded one more. And there are half a dozen podcasts, actually, that have come out in the past year. I can't even keep track of them now. One guy posted on our Facebook post, on our Facebook group recently, and I've never heard of his podcast. We had on um, the Roundhouse fellow recently. Oh, yeah, sure Nick, Nick yeah, Ozerak. Yeah. 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 So, you know, these people have come out since we've started, and I think... Uh, it's just so many possible. I want clubs. I mean, I know the NMRA regionals are starting to do this, but I'd like to see clubs record podcasts and actually talk about from starting a club layout through all the bits and pieces. Sorry, I hit the mic there. Through, let me say that again. Through all the bits and pieces, <laughs> I'd like to see 
like a variety of podcasts that just aren't being recorded currently. And mm. I think model railroading lends itself. I mean, video podcasts now. I started dabbling in video a little bit, not with regards to model rail radio, but just in <clears throat> another aspect of my life, which we did, I think, talk about on the first recording. But so I started dabbling in video as well. And I think this potential for video and you, I mean, obviously you've done video with, uh, uh, What's train, it called? Train, ma train Masters. Yeah, train it's, masters. I think now it's been renamed the video that doesn't have Lionel on it anymore. Uh, alas, <laughs> the boring video without Lionel. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. it. Yeah, the boring video. I was thinking train, of, I was thinking, what were you going to say, Ralph? The Trevor Marshall show. Oh, oh is that what it is now? <laughs> Isn't that what TM Train Masters <laughs> TV? Oh, oh, man. TM TV? Yeah, he's on it. Yeah, quite a bit. Actually, Tom, I was thinking about, I had an idea for years of, how about like a like a five minute hockey report? I could do that. Mm. Um. Mm. Anyways, we're coming to the end of your time. Your allotted time. Final, I, I want you to do. I look. I want you to do a bike podcast. Final. Uh, I would like to do that, but I don't think I have the personality for it. Mm. I really don't. I've actually thought about that, and I actually don't think I have the. That model railroading folk are are as you said at the beginning. Model railroading folk are a special and a a special kind of folk. I, you know what I think it is? I think I think generally model railroaders are 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 fairly intelligent. You have to be. There's a barrier for entry, like saying model rail radio, right? So you have to be able to get past the barrier of entry, which typically is being able to actually put a train and bits of rolling stock on some track. That's actually genuinely difficult for a majority of the population, I think. Is it? And I also wanted to say you said about Dave Freire there. I've never actually met the gentleman, but for about, I think I talked to him for like two seconds on your show once. So I should, uh, I should get around to getting him on on this show. And definitely. And and I was thinking too when you were talking about the other podcast and you were encouraging other people. Like, let's not encourage anybody else. Let's try to force everybody else out of podcasting. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. Uh, well, to be honest, I, I I've I've listened to the new Scotty show. And him with uh, what's his name, Paul Gillette? No, and uh, Dave. That's um, Mike Rose. Mike Rose. Mike oh, Rose. sorry, Mike Rose. Okay, um, that's a different podcast. Yeah. But it's yeah, exactly. It's they they t just talk back and forth to each other about product. So it's a product review thing. Uh, it's not. It's not like what you and Lionel do, where Without you're actually I think talking to people yeah. involved in the hobby. I. My perspective is that there's, they have a core following. Mm -hmm. And when they had more people on, when they had more voices, they probably had a broader reach. But they're just two buddies that are catching up and talking about what they're doing. I mean, my view is that the buddy cast, where two people just record a podcast about what they're doing, is a subgenre of many different podcasts. And that's basically what they're doing. Mm. I don't fault them for doing it. I mean, I've not actually met either of these gentlemen, like physically. I've spoken to Scotty on the phone a couple of times, and uh, obviously he's been on my podcast. I'm genuinely interested in meeting him. I like Dave Freire, I think. Um, they're both in the same part of the world as well, so when I eventually get to that part of the world, I'm sure I'll probably meet both of them. Um, but, you know, they do what they do, and it's different than what I do, and it's different than what Lionel does, but I don't fault them for what they do. They've got their fans. People listen to them. I don't mind listening to them occasionally. Well, here's an interesting point that I think would be a great question for both uh, Bruce, particularly for Ralph, because he said he listens to both the podcasts. Which one do you like better, Ralph, uh, Model Rail Radio or, or A Modeler's Life? And you're not on the spot. Just be completely honest. I'm, I'm not on the spot. I, ha I, <laughs> I, ha <clears throat> I have more fun because it's, it's interactive when on your show. Oh, okay. It is with Tom, but you have to wait your turn. Mm, uh, that's a, a flaw in the bubble rail radio format. That's, right? Many that's, people yeah. actually, <laughs> and and they're they're both good, but yeah. that's what I see as the difference. And that's, I know, Ralph. That's how you managed to start a modeler's life. Is but you wouldn't let me on, so I thought, well, to heck with you. I'll just start my own podcast and I'll just listen Damn to skippy. myself. Damn skippy! <laughs> 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 I want to be on, and Tom will let it. It's a lot talking other people. It was a, it's a, it's was like uh like when I'm when you're at the doctor's office and he's talking other but never mind all these other people I'm sick I want in. Mm -hmm. All right. So okay. So uh, I think we Chris, do you have any questions for Tom? Co questions or comments? Uh, <clears throat> one I've, thing I would mention uh, 
early on, and of course this is Lionel's hundredth birthday, not yours. But uh, <laughs> when you were when, you, <laughs> but uh, but I was thinking when you were reminiscing, it got me thinking. Um, when you were on talk show, you know it was it was. Uh, oh, I yeah. mentioned this before. I had been on a, involved in a Linux podcast on talk show years before. I I think anybody was doing any um, model road um, podcasting, and I got so frustrated with talk show. That when I started listening to Model Railroad Radio, the talk, it gave me it, it wasn't the it wasn't your what you were doing, but it was like these memories flooding in on me of being on Talk Show that it was very difficult. And when you got away from Talk Show, that was a that was a big, uh, big boon. <laughs> I think that whole that whole period was absolutely fascinating, but I find it difficult to go back. The quality of the audio is horrible. The resonance is really horrible. Um, yeah, I. I Skype has its flaws, but it's nothing like Talkshoe. I mean, Talkshoe... Well, the other thing with Talkshoe, though, is it did make it possible for... Uh, you You might not be familiar with this phenomenon, but we recorded four-hour-plus shows on Talkshoe. Right. The local phone company contacted me and said that this was an illegal use of the phone line. <laughs> and tried to, They thought I was having some data. <laughs> Who oh. knows? I was AOL or something. And I got these notices, and I actually started comparing notes with others that had had similar experiences. So now I was so glad to get on Skype. And actually, the movement to Skype is literally when I moved to the Bay Area. So before with TalkShoe, it was all in Vegas, and then I moved to the Bay Area, and it's all on Skype, because the first Skype call was on my birthday in 2011, when I just moved to the Bay Area. Hmm. That's cool. And so did Skype even exist before that? Oh, yeah. Yeah, oh, okay. Skype's existed for a long period of time. Oh, okay, uh, uh, Ralph, do you want to? Uh, do you have any questions for uh, Tom before we go? No, I'm good right now. Okay, and you say talk shoe. You know that's what I consider this to be a talk shoe. <laughs> <laughs> is, is, really is that like? Uh, is that like? Is that like a Maxwell smartphone? Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. That's really. what we know. Yep. How about you, Bruce? You got any questions you'd like to ask uh, Tom? Before? I don't. I just. I, I think it's fascinating because Tom, besides. Uh, Model Rare Radio. He's got a, a bunch of podcasts. He's got This Comes Next and Short Funk and you, Now what, Long Funk. What was the other one? Was the the Attics Attic that Aficionados. That's the yeah. one where I crossed the country. Although I'm still recording with Connor Sitesbow and I just literally finished a recording with him. And we're, But we're going to change up the format. I've said to Connor we're going to have to do another podcast because Attic Aficionados was me and one of the Jackass guys Brandon DiCamello. And we just talked about a whole lot of crazy stuff through that. And then Connor came on. But, yeah, I'm going to have to change the format up. So we'll, we're creating a new podcast. We're, yeah. we're uh, early phases development of a new podcast with Connor. And then you, you had that podcast with, uh, oh, I can't remember Heron his Stone? name. Stone Heron, Heron, Heron yep, Stone. Stone yep. Yep. He, like, he's, lit he's just gotten a Netflix account. And as I'm recording with you, he's trying to debug his Netflix with me. <laughs> I, I put the phone aside. So, yeah, believe me. Yeah, I didn't Netflix. Know you offered I... that service, Tom. That's great. Uh, yeah, really. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's what Next time, time I... the kids text me and want the uh, password, can I just have them text you and you can give them the password? Well, uh, <laughs> no. So, so, let, let, I, so, so the fact that you brought Netflix up. So, what happens when I go to turn Netflix on and the screen comes up and says, "I can't, we can't load your list for some reason"? What does that mean? <laughs> What platform are you on? Uh, That's one of the platforms I maintain, I don't think. I don't know. It's just coming through spe uh, uh, Spectrum is the company. Okay. I, unfortunately, that's a different team. So. I'm, I'm assuming that the reason it doesn't come up is because the the, uh, the router or the modem isn't, hasn't uh, yes. with it. But anyway, it's, it's, good. it's good. So does that mean I've completely lost control because you're asking him Netflix questions? No. No. No, no. no, no. <laughs> Maybe so you're on Tom my account. With the modeler's life. Remember maybe that. you're on my. Right. Maybe you're on my account or something. <laughs> I, I got one last question for you, Tom. Didn't I see that you posted somewhere where you got like thirty five hundred hours of people you're going to meet on some trip you're taking back east, all through Model Rail Radio or something? I think you're talking. Uh, that was Jim Gifford. Oh, is that Jim Gifford? Oh, okay. I don't know. Uh, no, we went back east. Oh, okay. We went back east and we did a, and I met Ron Kleiss. I was supposed to meet uh, Ralph de Blasey. Look, I missed out. You mentioned Jason Rice. I missed out meeting him just by sheer force of the fact that we were just brutally driving back as fast yeah. as we could get back to California. But yeah, I should have met with him. I, I'm i kicking myself I have not met him. So how fast? You, do you... Des Moines is actually an amazing place. Des Moines is, 
a city in the middle of nowhere. You're literally driving through the middle of nowhere, and then you're in the city. Have you been to Des Moines, Lionel? Have I been to Des Moines? Yeah, I passed uh, through it once for a week. Yeah. <laughs> it took me three hours for it to get there. I've been through there. I've been through there on my motorcycle, I think. Very good. At, at speed. I think I stopped at the McDonald's or something. Mm-hmm. Um, so you, you had to dr- you drove back as fast as you could. What does that imp- what does that imply? Like what is fast for uh, Tom Parbley? Yeah, here's what I'm guessing. Here's what I'm guessing, <laughs> Tom. Well, your version of fast and my version of fast are two entirely different things. Clearly, completely different things. <laughs> Clearly, completely different. Yeah, but Tom, you you didn't go fast. You got stuck in a snowstorm. I heard. We did. Yeah, we did. Yeah, we got stuck in Wyoming. In a snowstorm, which was actually the best community experience I have had in the real world in a long time. Literally, everyone around us got out of their cars. There was like a big St. Bernard dog. There were a group of kids playing in the snow. It was a great sense of community being stuck in a snowstorm in So what's happening? Laramie? Let me guess. Laramie, right? No, no, no. Uh, uh, We just... What's it? Springs, Rock Springs. We just gone through Rock Springs, Springs. and we were heading towards. uh, So I tell you, being from Wyoming, everybody has a stuck in Wyoming story, and it's nine times out of (laughs) ten, it's Laramie. I see everybody gets on I-70 and they get, they're get they just amazed that they shut the thing down when there's a blizzard. <laughs> yeah, we, we got a blizzard going there, but they didn't actually shut the roads down. I took some photos on the way there just before we hit Laramie. In fact, we avoided Laramie. We went down into Colorado. Mm-hmm. But uh, no, it was on the way back and we'd gone through, well, we'd stayed the night in Rock Springs, woke up, everything was covered in snow. We thought, well, we've got to try and make our way to Salt Lake. We, we eventually got there. Yeah. Who's this man you're standing with on your... You always put this picture of you and claim this fellow's your father. Who is he really? This is an interesting thing. I've actually had... D, I've had multiple DNA tests to prove that he's actually my father. All right. It's a very curious thing because as a boy growing up, he didn't think I was his son, as he wouldn't think. So it was a very curious thing. But DNA testing is very real and it gives you personable and important results. It also... We talk about my great uncle... It also welcomed me to my father's family more than my father was ever welcome to his family. So once you come with DNA results, no one's arguing with that. Hard side. Wow. <laughs> wow. I'm, I'm, I'm concerned if I did DNA, people would be like, oh, you're related to me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay. I, I do have a question. Uh-oh, a question for the floor. No, but it's, yeah, but it's, it's not a difficult one. All it's right. It's just I, I'm having trouble... Uh, understanding how you manage this you mm-hmm. have how many how many podcasts or shows that you do currently i think i'm well i'm trying to wind a couple of them down so i mean let's say i do four currently okay plus i'm and doing a bunch of noble late related content as well because of a particular comedian but we won't talk about that okay <laughs> <laughs> oh you got it what do you you're you well, like you're you know what you must be related to gordy robinson because you talk in riddles Mm. Noble Ape is, uh, but it's a particular comedian, but we won't talk about that. You can't say that. And go, that is that, you know what? That's rude. You can't say that well, in audio. And then, I don't want oh, to, I don't want to offend. I mean, I don't want to offend a group of your listeners or a group of well, any listeners. Well, by saying that's that. why I have this podcast is to offend. Very people. good. To offend yeah. people. Very yeah. good. So why, who's the comedian? Uh, I can't actually, I actually intentionally can't think of his name. I mean, I honestly <laughs> can't think of his name. He's so not the, the guy that was caught masturbating or any of the other things, but his time will come, I'm sure. Is it Jerry, so, Seinf- is it Jerry Seinfeld? <laughs> no, it's not Jerry no, Seinfeld. No. But oh, okay. he has interviewed Jerry. Uh, Jerry Seinfeld has interviewed him in his Comedians and Cars Getting Coffee. Oh. So, yeah. Anyway, so if you put no Ape into Google, you'll be able to see me and this other gentleman. But thankfully, this other gentleman will be ending his... I don't even know what he does with no Ape. None of the videos I see online is him, of him talking about no Ape at all. But he just called his tour Noble Ape. Now he's calling his comedy, you know, pay per view Noble Ape. Uh, But I don't know what it's got to do with me. So, oh, Jim Gaffigan. That's apparently the guy's name. Okay, is uh, Jim Gaffigan is bypassing Netflix and TV networks with his upcoming Noble Ape stand up special? Wow. Mm -hmm. So and I assume it has nothing to do with your noble ape that he's right. just taking. Well, the name. according to his lawyers, it would be very difficult for people to get confused between his work and my work, which I can't dispute. Right. What I can dispute is the claim that his lawyers make that my work has absolutely no bearing and has not worthy of any discussion. So that I have some concerns with. But his lawyers also represent like a notorious joke thief 
who so they've got no ethical standing as far as I'm concerned. They they anyway. they represent Henny Youngman. No, no, <laughs> a, a female joke thief. Yeah. Oh, there's a female joke thief. Who is who is yeah. that? Uh, she's got a show on. She's got a movie out currently. Oh my I god! I can't think of the name. Why? Well, anyway. Uh, <laughs> I'm, a, uh, I'm not going to promote her. You want me to promote her? Why? I don't. It's just I don't know any of this stuff. I'm like that's just, that's one of the reasons I have the podcast is because I am literally like the dumbest guy on the planet. And anyway, I'm, I'm creating a whole bunch of noble eight videos currently just to make the point subtly that I have actually done something with this thing over the past 23 years. And if this comedian wants to do his thing, I can do my thing. And according to his lawyers, no one's going to get confused. So I'm just going to keep doing my thing. Yeah. Well, I noticed your Wikipedia entry is still the number one result, so um, I'm sure that's going to piss him off. Well, who the hell knows? I mean, my view is, up until now, everyone, including some graphic design guy in the UK, when they create their no blape thing, they get in contact with me. They learn a bit about the history, they talk to me, and usually everything works out fine. Not like this guy. So, mm. Mr. Universe is an interesting IP that they... He, he has a previous show called Mr. Universe, right? Right. Mr. Universe changed their name. I'm not changing no blade. I'm not doing a thing. Mm. I'm just keeping on doing what I'm doing. Mr. Universe changed their name because of uh, Jim Gaffigan? Read about it, Lionel. Read I don't, about uh, it. Yeah. <laughs> I don't, you know what? You remind me. Uh, don't take this the wrong way. Do not, not take this the wrong way. You can say whatever you want about uh, me, Lionel. Okay. It's fine. Uh, well, no, this isn't meant to be an insult. This is this is not meant to be an insult. You caveat so many times. Just say it. <laughs> well, <laughs> I'm a married man. People insult me all the time, to my core. Um, <laughs> you remind me of Ken Patterson. You just wear me out. Well, <laughs> <laughs> like I can't. Like yeah, Jim Ken Patterson will talk to me, and you know, like he had me on his his uh, video podcast show one night, and it's just I was exhausted after ten minutes. It's like we've been on the air for fifty-seven minutes, and you were a little, you were a little, uh, you know, you were like a a cold car. Uh, you were like a um a, a cold uh, on a um, uh, you know one of those things that you drive. What do they call those automobiles? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you were like a cold engine on a on a on a winter morning. But once I got you warmed up, it's like I'm exhausted. I feel like I'm going to have to sleep like fourteen hours tonight. There's so much to keep up with you. You're like such an interesting guy. Are you the winter morning though? That's what I'm wondering. Yeah, I probably am. I probably am. Yeah. I'm like I'm just like uh, uh, I'll the just... sun is coming out. Yeah. <laughs> uh, don't talk. Don't talk to him before ten. So Very so good. so far, Jim Gaffigan is. Uh, I see that he's doing no blape, and now of course we know that you've been doing no blape for. He probably got the idea from. For he probably found you on on uh, the inter internet, the www. So apparently, so... according to his lawyers, that. They cannot. They can neither confirm nor deny that particular yeah. point. But I think it's pretty subtle. So you actually contacted his lawyers, or you had a lawyer contact his lawyer, like his your people contacted his people. This whole thing, you need to appreciate where I work as well. Okay, there are so many levels to this thing of crazy stupidness that my view is he'll put out his pay per view, which he's going to try and do whatever he's going to do with. I'm going to be developing Noble Ape in ten years' time. I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing. Let's see where his pay-per-view goes. All the best to him getting as much money as he possibly can get out of this apparent piece of IP. Then, I look, only on your show, Lionel, I think there are so many other intellectual properties that he could go after. Mm. I mean, you know, why not call his next show? I mean, he's got two political parties. Why not go after the Catholic Church? I think there are so many intellectual properties he could go after here. So, yeah, Bill Maher did that. That's pretty cool, though that he's uh, that you're uh, you're that you're 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 dusting it up. You're 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 exchanging the dukes with uh, Jim Gaffigan. That's pretty cool. I don't even know who this guy was. I couldn't watch his specials. I just fell uh, asleep. In have you seen the movie Chap? Stuff. Have you seen the movie Chappaquiddick? Is he in it? Yeah. Well, then it won't be a movie that I'm seeing. Actually, that's a movie I wanted to see. So, so what? You know what? I'll it, see it in 10 years. You it know. took us Sorry, an hour. It, you, you already know the outcome. Of, of, yeah, it's just, subtle. <laughs> um, so it took us about an hour, but now we're getting into the juicy stuff. You're dusting it up with the, with the, with the likes of the who's who of Hollywood. Apparently so. Well, well, we, can get it, we can get into uh, what's your connection with Apple. Yeah, what's your connection with Apple? Well, funnily enough, this thing called Noble Ape, 
2003, two Apple engineers, one of whom still actively follows my work, uh, publicized Noble Ape. They put it at uh, the Worldwide Developers Conference, and then they started putting it on every computer that they shipped for about 10 years. Really? Because Noble Ape's meaningless until this comedian apparently started using it. No, it's uh, and then Intel started using it in 2005, and just a bunch... I mean, that's that's why I am where I am. Because I've worked with Apple for, you know, however many years and kept them happy for however many years. So. I thought you they used it as a benchmark, or what are they doing? They originally used it as a benchmark, uh, the eight brains per second, but also um, they used it in terms of real-time graphics because I was able to do all the processing and have real-time graphics running okay. together. That's what they used it for. So have you made, like, billions and billions of dollars from this thing? The aim is to retire... I mean, the aim is to retire comfortably, Right. Right. <laughs> Maybe earlier, right? But maybe later. But uh, as it is currently, I have a little patch of the UK where I just want to spend the last few years of my life pottering around, like uh, Turing, the oh. mathematician. Except I won't be eating any poison apple. So you own. So that's the plan. So you own land in the United Kingdom. Yes, eventually. That's the why end don't, game. Why the don't you? Why don't you like Australia? Um. Australia has taken a number of really interesting turns. I mean, I never, mm. when I lived in Australia, people would say to me, How long have you been here? And it's a country that I grew up in, but never really felt like I was an Australian for a variety of reasons. Uh, their sport's crazy. They have a variety of quite curious political views. They have a way of talking around a variety of issues. Now, I love going to Australia. I've got family in Australia, I've got friends in Australia. But it's just not the place where I'm going to end up. Mm. Okay. And you don't like San Jose? <laughs> San Jose's interesting. <laughs> it's an interesting place. What is Noble Ape? I don't even understand what Noble Ape is. Like Noble I, Ape like is, you've got to you, you've got to dumb it down. You gotta dumb it down for a guy like Let me, me. try, Lionel. Let me try. Let me try. I'll I'll try it and if it's not dumbed down enough, ask me to dumb it down more. Okay. You've got the external world, that stuff that goes on outside your body and then you've got the internal world which is stuff that goes on inside your brain primarily well you know mind whatever so the idea was to create two simulations one that simulated an outside world a rich biological environment with plants and animals and insects and a variety of things and then look at how you could simulate an ape interacting with that environment what was going on inside the ape whether the ape had multiple actors you might when you think about things in the future, or sometimes you think of people, it's almost like a play going on inside your head. Well, Noble Ape has that simulated within it. It has multiple actors, it has their interaction, it has language. So the idea was to create a almost like a philosophical clearinghouse where you could put all these different ideas and see what came out of it. Because people weren't doing that at the time. They still aren't really doing that. No one's. There are a few simulations that have gone close in certain areas, but no one's really doing what Noble Ape does. So that's what Noble Ape is. Yeah, that wasn't dumb enough. Okay. <laughs> eight likes banana. Eight needs to find banana. Yep. So why would you? Why did to make bananas? Why would you? Do, for eight finding banana. Why did? Why? What possessed you to start that? Like that's kind of the same thing as model railroading. Like for mm -hmm. somebody to like say exactly. somebody. Here, here's an idea. Like take this for example. This is something that I often think about, and you know, I'll be driving down the road. I'll be on the bike. You know, I like when I'm on the on my on my Harley on those long, long trips. You know, and you, it's a long, lonely stretch road. You'll think of something, and oftentimes I'll think to myself, "Why would a guy buy two or three acres of land with an old Texas and Pacific section house on it?" Hmm. You know, it's one of those things. And 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 I said, what if a guy lived in Argyle, Texas, and he bought just a two or three acres with an old Texas and Pacific section house on it? I think, uh, has Chris, have you turned off your mic? No, I'm just waiting to hear your answer because I'm, I'm just, I'm dying to know. I have no idea. That's what I'm wondering. Oh, I mean, you wonder okay. about it. You wonder about it, right? So, so is that like, is that what, is that what Noble Ape is? My perspective is that as a child growing up, I was told things about the future that required active participation. Like I was told about flying cars, for example. I was told about computers that could think. I was told, I was promised so much through science fiction, and I thought, well, I've got to, like, take some part of this. I've got to take responsibility for some aspect of this. No one's doing, you know, rich simulations like I thought they could be written. Why don't I just put all these? Because prior to Noble Ape, I'd written almost all the components of Noble Ape just in different areas. 
It was just literally putting it all together and making it into Noble Blake, but I did when I was about 19. Because I'd already written game software and antiviral software and visualization software and all these things. So I just put these various bits and pieces together and started gluing them together and adding more stuff. And that was Noble Blake. Okay. So, see, this is why I shouldn't have a show. Because uh, what my point was going to be, and it was a really good one, but I got completely thrown off when Chris didn't say anything. So then I'm thinking either A, he's mm. on mute, or somehow yeah. I've insulted him. And... <laughs> So what, where I was headed was, it must be like, it's the same thing that, uh, and this is a great question for Ralph and Bruce and, and uh, Chris. Uh, what is it that possesses us to build model railroads that are of sizable dimensions? And it's, you know, you can see it's a, an 8, 10, 20 year adventure. What is it that possesses us? Because it's kind of the same thing. Like, Noble Ape is so complicated. It's like years and years and years of work, and it's the same as a exactly. model railroad. Same as exactly. a model railroad. So what is what is it that possesses us as humans to start a model railroad? What is that thing? What is it What is it that... The, see, that, that goes back to my question is, what is... what I, I need to know this before my time is up. What is it that draws us to model railroading and makes us build these layouts and such i need to know this it's a pressing question well you know in some ways model railroad is actually a simulation unlike exactly yeah exactly no point yep. oh, okay so hey what do you think tom of uh, elon musk's idea that we're all just living in a simulation have you, have you given that any uh air time at all or <laughs> well it's been before a while elon musk before Elon Musk came up with that, I came up all, with that. All right, yeah, well, wait a minute. Time out. I knew that that was too. <laughs> Let me just say that. Can I answer Lionel's last question? I think it's childlike wonder. I think childlike wonder actually governs all these things. And we are just taken back to some time, simpler, easier times. And what we're trying to recreate is some aspect of childlike wonder. And that's the whole hobby. That's simulation, model railroading, the whole thing is just a sense of amazement that we can actually get things to move and look realistic and all these things, which is ultimately, I think, childlike wonder. It's, all, it's also about control because it's something it's you can control it. And, and it won't be influenced by anybody else. Yes. Except um, the, and that could be your childhood too. So There's there's another part of it that I see. A lot of a lot of model railroaders are, are in it. And and don't get me wrong here, uh, they're doing it because they want to show off what they can do. They've gained the ability to do this stuff through the childhood wonder, through the um, uh, interest in, in, and mostly it's with guys, the interest in heavy machinery. Mm -hmm. And now you've got it in miniature, and then you build on that, and and once you start getting into being more realistic than just a toy it's it's a whole different ball game you're you're doing it not only to satisfy yourself but to show it off actually i think and, go ahead no i'm I, go ahead i was just going to say i said that once before i i was saying that i've said that a few times i think hobbies in general are about showing off and not showing off like as in look at how great i am like right. it's it's showing off in that you know you build a model like you build uh, static models, uh, Ralph, and the interim and the plastic whatever they call that the yep. international plastic model or something or other society. Yeah, yeah, and I mean you do these static models and you take them to shows, not with the intent of showing it off in the look at how great I am sense, but in in a pride of workmanship and you'd like other people to look at it and see what it is. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's probably what this podcast is. I mean, really, this podcast, I started this particular podcast because I thought, hey, I like that. That sounds like fun. I love talking on Tom's podcast. I should try it. And really, you know, I say, oh, my goodness, I'm thrilled with the amount of people that listen to it. But the more people that listen to it, the prouder I become of what I've mm -hmm. created. So mm -hmm. I, think, I think all hobbies are primarily about showing off. Does the ape have a name? Yeah, <laughs> they have double barrel names because they're noble apes. They have so there are 256. Actually, I think there are 64 possible first names and two lots of 32 possible second names. So they have double barrel names because they're noble apes. And uh, yeah, they have names. 
What's a double-barreled name? Um, oh, do we have any examples of double-barreled names? Well, I'm looking here. Bobby Conocite's Joe. Bowen. It, it just means that you take the mother and father's name, typically, and put them together. Oh, you mean like uh, your name is William Smith. Williams. Your name is Todd Williams Smith. Yes. Okay, so I have now I have another question that has plagued me now for several years. <laughs> <laughs> several years, and you are the man to answer this question. You are mm. the man to steer me, to help me, to help me make my life. When I wake up tomorrow, my life will be that much more enriched because you mm. can answer this question for me. Because I am, I am basically a redneck. I mean, for all intents and purposes, I am a, a card-carrying redneck. Because when I saw people starting to do that, you know, my name is Bennett. Uh, my name is Bennett uh, Stanley. My name is my name is Caroline Bennett Stanley, and they would put the mm. two names together. I would mm. think, as a redneck, I would think, man, that is just like the dumbest thing I ever saw. Because mm -hmm. I didn't get because I didn't get it right. And rednecks, when it, things are different, they don't. You know, their first instinct to say it's no good. But then, as time went along, you know, I I matured somewhat, and I started to go, okay, well, if that's the way they want to do it, you know, it's their right to choose and to do whatever they want. But here's where I get. Here's where I I go full circle back to being a one hundred percent red blooded uh, uh, redneck, a uh, North American redneck. It's like. When uh, Caroline Bennett Stanley marries Tommy Walters Athern, do they end up now their name, their kid's name is going to be Joey Bennett Stanley Walters Athern? I think they just take the first names of the two. There's some rule associated with double barrel naming when they, but the whole actually no. Look, the purpose of double barrel naming. Let's talk about the purpose of it is that one or both of those names have important land-holding rights, which is why it's noble. That's the joke. So sometimes you have nobility. I think Winston Churchill is an example, and there are a few others that have like five names that have been tacked on to them based on their lineage. So you can get double-barrel, double-barrel names when the lineage is important and they have to recognize all of the lineage in the people. It's a bit like... Um, you know, these dogs which are bred, they have like long lineages and it's important to know that their, you know, great great grandfather came over from Wales or something like that. I mean it's humans as dogs, basically. So how do we determine that my lineage isn't as important as like the problem is it was going fine. You know what? It was working out really well. I didn't I, I, your your explanation makes a lot of sense until we got to the yuppie era. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. And that's when things went horribly sideways. Mm. Then, then, okay. then you know, uh, Caroline uh, Bennett married Tommy Stanley, and they decided, you know, Caroline decided they want she wanted to keep her names, and and Tommy, you know, he wanted her to have his name, so they went with Tom, you know Caroline Bennett Stanley, and that's when thing and it's, with no lineage, no excuse other yeah. than other people are doing it, and it's like it's like well, okay, if you see other people. You know, if you see other people going eighty and you know eighty miles an hour, or eighty if eighty kilometers, what's eighty? Fifty fifty miles an hour in a sixty mile an hour zone. Do you do it? Like like I like I it seems to me people started doing the double. I never even heard of it called it, double barreled names. Lionel, I think that still goes back to the lineage sort of thing. Yeah, uh, they they took on uh, they kept their own name because of the job that they held. And when they, <clears throat> when they got married. They tacked on the husband's name, but they maintained their own. Okay. I wonder how many people. And, I wonder how many people I've insulted tonight. But go ahead, Ralph. And some of them actually called themselves. Uh, what the hell was the prefix they used? Ms. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, now we're getting think, into the weeds here. Do you think it'll be <laughs> yeah. more or less than normal? What the number of people you insult? Uh, I think tonight is more. Like, what's mm. the over under? That's what we really need to know. <laughs> I think I think tonight the over the over, like I think normally I in, in, insult about thirty percent of the like really insult thirty percent of the audience. Okay, and you I, think mm. we'll be up in the like high forties now? Uh, I think, yeah, I think I'm. I think I'm. Yeah, I think I'm closing in on like half the people are going to be insulted. Oh, one of these days you're going to have a hundred percent podcast, <laughs> or that's going to be epic. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it'll be noble. 
No, <laughs> <It will. laughs> which takes which takes me back to my original question, Tom. You're doing mm -hmm. all these podcasts. You're mm -hmm. you're doing all the editing for these things, mm -hmm. and then you do your <laughs> monorail radio show, and you do editing for that. When do you find time to actually work? Uh, I, I actually, it's interesting. I, so in the past three years, I've suffered mental deterioration, quite noticeable mental deterioration, and I've basically written down and automated large portions of my life because of that. So the stuff that I do at work, I typically, I work on weekends too. I did a bit of work today, but no, it doesn't, it, it's when I started developing open source, I wrote about doing it. And what I wrote there was that you, you always have an active mind and sometimes you're doing things like, for example, you're putting salad onto your plate in some queue of people where you've got plenty of brain cycles to do other stuff while you're putting salad on your plate in a queue of people. So my perspective is actually that you, we have a lot more time if we have hobbies or ideas or anything that we're working on. There's a wide variety of times and places that it comes up. And, yeah, it's interesting. I guess I'm very procedural associated with how I do things. And it was funny, actually, when I met my wife. I met my wife uh, 18 years ago now. And my wife had her own hobbies. She had her own interests. She quilts. And Adobe recently interviewed her. And she does a bunch of different things. And when I met my wife, I realized that she actually understood what I did. And I understood what she did, and we had mutual respect for each other. But I think, in general, most people aren't optimizing their lives around doing stuff. They, you know, do other things, and that's just the way they live. So, uh, they're not doing stuff; they're doing other things. Well, well they're, doing they're not optimizing associated with podcasts, right? Example. They're not creating for right. podcasts. Well, creating is huge. I think that's another yeah. thing that makes model railroaders in general a more interesting people because they're all people that are busy creating. Creating exactly. is like. Creating is one of the most important things you can do in your life. Mm. Like, I mean, mm. uh, all three of these guys that are here, Ralph and Bruce and Chris, I mean, each one of these guys is busy creating life. That, that is like huge. It's just like probably uh, the most hugest thing that you can do, I think. And hugest isn't a word, and I know that, but we've all agreed that I'm a redneck, so that's okay. But it, but it's going to be great. It's going to be unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's going to be huge. It's going to be huge. huge. It's going to be uh, huge. It's going to be. This is going to be one of the best. Ever. <clears throat> this is like the best podcast ever. I know podcasts. I've done podcasts. This is the best podcast ever. Um, <laughs> God, hey, Bruce and I made. I, I actually edited a podcast us. called the best damn podcast ever for a period of time. Now that's back in two thousand seven. So, oh, you're almost there, Lionel. You're almost there. Yeah, exactly. But creating is here. That is probably one of the most Im important elements of model railroading. You think people are thinking, oh, my God, I wish he hadn't hit the record button. And yet we've gone full circle and we've come to a point where I think we could all agree. Look at you, Ralph. I mean, I how many times, Ralph, even though you, we, you and I irritate the living crap out of each other on a regular basis, how mm -hmm. many times do I say what a great artist you are? And you must find you must find that to be extremely gratifying to be able to do that. Yeah, yeah. Like you seem it's to, also it's also sometimes embarrassing, but that's okay. It goes with the territory. Embarrassing because it's not very good. No, because well, <laughs> what, that's the wrong he's word. a modest guy. And <laughs> there you go. Oh, you. okay. Thank you, Chris. He doesn't yeah. want to be fawned on. Oh, all right. Okay. All over. <laughs> it happens. So, so Tom, where is the 150th Model Rail radio show going to be? Yeah. I was thinking it should be in Amherst, actually, but I don't know if I can pull it off. Uh, okay. My thought was, um, my, I was originally thinking it needs to be on the East Coast, and Amherst just makes logical sense. Mm. But then the first thing that needs to happen is that I need to make sure that Michelle is in a spa of some description, being completely pampered, potentially in Hawaii, whenever this thing is done. <laughs> she was she was quite literally hospitalized after yeah. the show 100 yep. hospitalized so, well, what happened yeah yeah what happened? so she had pneumonia afterwards oh my goodness um, gracious that's which not was good. very real yeah so, absolutely and well she had 60 plus strange men as as bruce will attest to 60 plus strange men <laughs> <laughs> 60 strange men. were you were you did you go bruce uh, yeah you did, 
Yeah, I was. Well, we I can't running, pass. Yeah. We can't pass that yeah. up. Okay, so. I was monitoring the podcast and 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 playing it out, um, um, yeah. sort of like a loudspeaker downstairs while everybody was individually going upstairs to be interviewed. Oh yeah, that's right. I remember that now. Okay, yeah. and and where were you living at the time? Where was I living at the time? I asked you first. Oh, okay, I was I was in uh, in the Medford area. Okay, yeah, and so you I had that long drive. drive. I had driven down to San Jose and uh, actually stayed in the – I think I stayed in the same hotel at um, – oh, I can't remember his name. Yo City Gage. Center? Oh, uh, huh? Jim Yo- Lincoln? No, not Jim Lincoln. Terry Terrence. Uh, oh, Terry, Terry Terrence. Uh, Terry Terrence, yeah. yeah, Terry Terrence. yeah I'm yeah. sorry, Terry. If you're listening to this, I'm very sorry. It's been a while. But uh, he and I would – he would uh, uh, bring me from the hotel to there because I didn't have a – I don't think I had a car or I had my car. But he would bring me over to the house. So, and then we set the computer up, and and uh, Tom would have his studio upstairs, and people would go up, and then people downstairs got to listen, and then we had the camera. There's so a YouTube here. video, two YouTube videos of Show 100. I think. Yeah. Are you have you seen these videos, Lionel? They uh, built a train, a, a modular I N-scale remember train. Remember that, yeah. Through yeah. the downstairs of our house, it was amazing. Yeah. Then, it got a, then it got attacked by the cat. Yeah, that'll happen. So you pretty much uh, you've pretty much made this hundredth show pretty much seem just about as lame as it could be because all I've done is all I'm doing is sitting here in my my pajamas and talking to you and three other guys. Like you could have gone big, Lionel. You I decided could. to go into it. That's that's <laughs> you've ruined power to you. You've ruined the you've ruined <laughs> the whole thing. I mean, it's like. Like first off, I was only going to have you on for fifteen or twenty minutes. And now we're, this has become uh, a whole show by yeah. itself. You've completely. Re- I knew this was going to happen. You were <laughs> going to take <laughs> over the show. You've. Got, this is <laughs> some sort that. of sabotage thing on your part, trying to sabotage a, a modeler's life so it would it'll disappear into the sunset, and you can oh. you can be the king of all model railroading podcasts. It's a conspiracy. It's what can so, I say? So, Lionel, when, what's your uh, best guess of when this will air? Uh, I know well, exactly. You know I know exactly okay. when this will air. From now. No, <laughs> I know exactly when this will air because it will air as show one hundred. Every every once in a while. Yeah. Every very once in a while, a show will get slotted in, and this will air in the second, the second, uh, third Monday of June, which is. Let me just open my Apple phone. And that's twenty eighteen, right? Twenty eighteen. I'm opening. I'm okay. going to the calendar now. It will air on June the eighteenth. Of wow. 2018. 2018. Nice. So you have between now and June the 18th to really just outdo Tom's 100th episode. You just, I mean, you just, you could do nothing but record from now until June 18th. And everything goes into the 100th episode. It could be like a 100 hour episode. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> That's a good idea. And then we could have a big, big get together and play it. Ten and a half hours. So yeah, you got ten, ten and, and a half, half hours is the number to beat, Lionel. Yeah, I, I'm in. I'm in an hour that's and like twenty. A, that's like a typical virtual hobby shop for Lionel. <laughs> 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 that's pretty fun. That's good. I'm in an hour. We're, we're in an hour and twenty five minutes. I don't see much else happening. This is pretty much the hundredth episode. Now hundred and one. Now I'm going to have to do a hundred and one, and and talk to everybody else on a hundred. <laughs> You did two episodes for Tom in the beginning. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's that's. And as a matter of fact, they're they're they are the most downloaded, some of the most downloaded episodes. Except you don't believe in statistics, so there's no point in me telling you that. Well, that's Fair because everybody thinks they're going to start at the beginning and then they. Yeah, then they fo- then yeah. <laughs> they give up. <laughs> <laughs> beginning, what's that? Yeah. Uh, episode one. All right. Yeah. Well, we better finish with some sort of uh, Bruce. What's your favorite part of a modeler's life? My favorite part, yeah, the, com- the camaraderie. Yeah, oh, I thought it was when you read the I email. think it, everybody that comes on the show, they have something to give. Um, you find out about other stuff than model railroading, which is that makes it even more interesting. I mean, all your interviews you've done, the model railroading is the part that sort of connects everybody. But then when they start talking about all the stuff that they do, uh, their lives, you know, their family. Um, their history, it just, it just makes everybody even more, you know, sort of connected. Yes. Family. Yes. Family. Yeah. Even though, yeah. Yeah. Family. 
Yeah, the connection that we've made with all the people. That's been the best part by a mile. Ralph, what, what do you, what's your favorite part other than you uh, when you're on? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's it's like like Bruce said, it's it's the getting together, discussing what's going on with with each other, um, and and talking about new stuff and new things that are coming out on 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 in the railroad industry and so on that maybe didn't hear about. So a lot of a lot of guys that come on have inside, uh, yes, inside, you know, yeah. an inside line. Like Pam Pastels. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. Here's a question for Tom. Uh, Chris, I'm not ignoring you. Uh, here's a good question for you, Tom. If the, mm -hmm. if the Noble 8 was weathering, would he use, was he use powders or would he use Pan Pastels? Well, if Jim Gaffigan, I, no, I can't do a Jim Gaffigan joke, can I? Sure, um, go ahead. No. Because apparently the Jim Gaffigan line that I use, because I've never seen any Jim Gaffigan, is not something that he'd do because he's a family-friendly comedian. So let's move on from him. Um, I think if an ape was going to do weathering, it would probably use uh, collected things that it had found, which actually model railroaders do as well. We were talking to Ken Anderson last show. He does yep. exactly that. He takes little bags of stuff wherever he goes, and then he you know, sifts it out and puts it on his lap. Mm. Okay. Yeah. So it would use stuff that it finds. Mm. Does the noble ape have a name? So there is no name for the noble ape other than the noble ape. What do you mean? I don't know what I. I don't I have no idea what I mean. <laughs> I'm completely lost. That whole noble ape thing just. I'm complete. I walk around in a fog, going, I don't understand that noble you, ape. You, thing. you real. You realize, Lionel? There's a there's a noble ape in the program that's named Lionel. He's just walking around in circles. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> e e e <laughs> eating out of a bag of barbecue potato chips. <laughs> Cheese balls. Cheese yeah. balls. Yeah, Cheese he's balls. A, yeah. There we go. Uh, Chris. Chris. Now you you got your you got the Atkins dot. You've been a you have been a super duper just like Bruce and Ralph. Your super duper contributor to the show and the old AML network. What is it? What is it you like the best about it, or what does it mean the mo What does it mean to you? Well, one thing I think that's uh, pretty impressive is the extension beyond the podcast to the Facebook community, which is very active. And, and it's neat when you hear people's names on the podcast, and a lot of those names are also on Model Row Radio. And then you see what they're doing on Facebook, and you can see a little bit more of their modeling and pictures they're sharing and, you know, a little bit into their lives and, you know. Right. So that's pretty cool. I think that's kind of neat. So it's not only just a community listening to – uh, you know, us listening to others, but it's also, you know, seeing social media and so forth. Right. Yeah. It's the connection with all the people. It's still, it's the connection. It's, uh, uh, I'm telling you, the NMRA is missing the boat by so, they are miss this, they are what so wide right on this one. It's like they could have the, the, the NMRA grow like crazy if they embrace this thing. As Tom, speaking about going to Amherst. Mm -hmm. This is free. You don't. I won't charge you for this. Some of the stuff that I said tonight, I will send you a bill for, but this I won't charge you for. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, I use uh, to do my portable recording. I use this Zoom H5 thing, which is not overly expensive, and then I have mm -hmm. two handheld mics, like you'd see on stage, guys. You know, they're sure. I think they're in fifty eights or whatever they call them. But Certainly. also with this, uh, uh, I'm going to experiment. Also with this Zoom H5 thing, you can get a a plug in that goes in the plug. And you take out the speakers that it come or the microphones it comes with, and you plug in this adapter, and you can have you could actually have four stage quality mics. And that's mm. I'm going to try that in Kansas City. So you can actually have four guys re re uh, being recorded at the same time. Think of yourself as like mm. the Eagles. I think those mm. sure mics are what Jim Gaffigan uses. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, he doesn't use those mics. Believe me. <laughs> do you know? Do you know the? Uh, you know what the only? You know one of the uh, main advantages of wearing glasses is. You can do the dramatic removal. Hmm. This yeah. is true. Yeah. <laughs> it works particularly well on podcasts. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> There's a whole page of Jim Gaffigan jokes. All right, uh, all right. So uh, you know what? It's uh, you know what? We've done a whole show. 
We've done a whole show. Tom, you have managed to come in here, commandeer the show, take over. This. You've gone on the bus. You've taken over. You've sat yourself in the driver's seat and taken over and, and taken us on a lovely country drive on a Sunday Thank afternoon. You. Yeah. Thank you. And now we're out of gas. Now we're deserted because you weren't paying attention. <laughs> we're, we're, we're 20 miles from nowhere and yeah. we're out of gas. But, but who cares? We're having such a good time. That's, that's, that's true. true. Okay, that's true. At least it's not snowing. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> exactly. At least it's the springtime and it's finally stopped snowing. Um, all right. So we need to do our email address. Uh, I think Bruce, Mr. Kelly, uh, this is an ideal time for you to do the email address. Yeah, okay. If you want to contact us through the wonders of email, you, all you have to do is write in modelerslife at gmail.com. That's modelers1L one, one L like railroad, not two L's like Kelly. And we have a Facebook page, amodelerslife.com. It's amodelerslife.com. The, it's the www.amodelerslife.com. And on that page, you can find a link to our Facebook uh, page, and you can find a link to our Patreon page, where if you pay five bucks a month, you'll get a whole bunch of other stuff, which a lot of people like to do. If you haven't heard enough of us, you can hear more of us. And I'm going to close. Tom, do you have a last word? Well, you didn't ask me what I liked about a modeler's life. Yeah. Ah, didn't I yeah. Just, didn't can we I close just, on that? Uh, didn't I just ask you if you had a last word? Okay, can I... <laughs> <laughs> I didn't. I didn't say. I, speak, please, I didn't say these are your topic. Per, uh, uh, per, uh, what's the word for when you're not allowed to go outside of boundaries? These are your, these are your topic parameters. Strengths. Yeah, these are your topic parameters. I said, do you have a last word? Which means speak on anything you'd like. Which was kind of I was working up to that. Okay. Well, I'd like to say that the thing I love about your podcast is the diversity of people that you bring in, the long format, which I have a lot of respect for. And the patience you have with people to allow them to tell their stories. I mean, I think you've taken this podcasting medium, you've put it in a completely different direction, and I love listening to the stuff that you do, Lionel. So thank you very much for having me on Show 100. Well, I couldn't have the Show 100 without you. And I'm going to finish with this. This is literally the actual truth. Had it not been for you and Model Rail Radio and having that podcast, I would not be talking to you right now. We wouldn't have this podcast. This podcast would not exist had you not taken the time to create Model Rail Radio and allow me on it and then irritate the crap out of me by not letting me talk as long as I want. And because mm -hmm. you were because you were very organized and you realized other people wanted to say their piece too, I left in a huff and created my own podcast. And here now, here we are 100 shows later. How cool is that? So it's all down to you, Tom. Thank you, Lionel. Thank you very much. Oh, I hit the, forgot to hit the record button. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> Next Sunday? <laughs> okay, all right. Tom, I screwed all that up. Interesting. Interesting. I'm here. I'm here. <laughs> I'm, I'm wondering how you precisely screwed it up. I think I screwed up more than you did. So. No, no, no. You were. That was a great interview. That was exactly what I wanted. For the hundredth interview, I wanted you to be on because if it hadn't been for you, it never would have started. And I wanted you to be Tom. I wanted you to be Tom. That was exactly what I wanted. I want Tomisms. I wanted noble <laughs> ape stories. I wanted to argue with you about double-barreled names. I thought <laughs> I did a bit of it all. Yeah, we did it all. We talked about the 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 model railroading. We talked about. What I, you know, I wanted some nuggets because you'd been doing it for nine years. I was very happy. You know, the problem was, as we got to the end of the show, mm -hmm. I had only planned on talking to you for like a half an hour. And yeah. then I was excited because we got on talking about all that other stuff, just like the old Tom that I remember. And then at the end, I wanted to make sure I thanked you. Certainly. Certainly. So at the end of every episode... Every single one of these interview episodes, and this is episode 100, what happens is I say this little ditty, and then at the end of it, you say happy rails to you. But I, was so, I was so emotional after telling you how much it meant to me, and then you said thank you, and I was like, and then I just turned it off.
after 99 times. It's like a mic drop, right? Yeah, yeah. Like after 99 times of getting people to say happy rails to you, we get to the 100th show, the big celebration show, the big the big watermark show, and I go, okay, see ya. <laughs> so this is still why you are the king of Model Railroad podcasting, and I am but your your learned student grasshopper. You're my David Letterman. I think that's the way we put it, right? Uh, okay. Very good. <laughs> All right. So are you ready? I'm ready. You know what you have to say? I believe so. All right. Well, Tom, as we close the barn doors on another episode of A Modeler's Life and the sun slowly sets over the back 40, I guess there's nothing else left to do except for you to say... Happy rails to you. It's another Lincoln Homer.